I used to stand between my dad's legs looking at the match to his coach, you know. De Desi Gallagher, Jimmy Burnside, David Pugh. Loved them. And I wasn't one of these guys out there from Sligo, the crap. I loved the Sligo guys. I always thought, my God, I want to be there. I wanted to come here. My dream was to play here. People you meet in the showgrounds are what makes it what it is. And it's not about, not always about the players. And it's not always about who's, who's wearing the jersey on the pitch or who's standing in the dugout. That, that stuff can sometimes maybe feel a bit less important. People don't understand why just the one club, but it's my club. That's what I'm going to support. And I have no interest in following any other club. was the main soccer town for years and Slag Rovers were, were, were there from the very beginning and Slag Rovers were the only club, it was only the one Slag Rovers, that was it and we followed them every, everywhere they went. If you would say to me when I was signing for Sligo Rovers that I would play probably in two League Cups and four FAI Cup Finals and a Blacksnet Final and win the Cup and win the League, I'd have pulled your arm off. No, but I mean, Fago would be my like hero over my lifetime. I mean, he gave me so much help. As a youngster, he hardened me up because he'd rattle me, kick me and give me stick and that and I'd be <laughs> getting annoyed at him, but he was right. He sorted me out and stopped moaning, but then got on with it, and he was great. And he had a fantastic career. I mean, he's, he'd be my number one Sligo Rovers player. There's nothing like playing for your hometown. You might win things away from home, but winning in your hometown, that's why I say to you, like, they're no different than me. They have a bit of pride in the place and their family as well, you know, like, and that's what it's all about. I mean, I must have been playing kind of fairly well in junior football and whatnot, and... Then days I used to go down, down the north playing in a few summer competitions, and I got a bit of notice. And I heard one day that Derry City were kind of going looking at me and whatnot. So I put two and two together, and, and I, presu I presume the Sligo Rovers probably heard the same thing. And it couldn't be seen that a fellow like me would say them not looking at me. So Jimmy Gamerton came over there. I was in working in Hanson's that time. And Jimmy came over and he, he said, well, it, well, like a sign, but it was from Berkeley. Tony Berkeley had arrived in the town that time. The pitch now and the surroundings, there was no lights. And I was running around the dark and all of a sudden, that night I seen about 10 fellas with this man coming down. And I was called, I was called over and Tony th th said who I was, the, the Tony Berkeley. And he just said, if you sign for me, he says he, I make a player out of you. When he was from England, I was kind of excited, so I just said it was no problem. So I signed, and the rest is history. My dad used to go to the showgrounds for all his life, from the early, the foundation of this row was in 1928. So I've been brought to the showgrounds since I was about six. I've always kind of remembered, I suppose, kind of Cork Hibs, Cork Celtic, that type of team, you know, and, and the old fence. Nancy, Nancy Pugh and Callaghan and Maureen, you know, with the three ladies sitting behind the chairs at the dugouts, road and abuse at referees, visiting players, you name it, they did it. So apart from that, I think that was one, some of the earlier things that kind of stuck out in my mind. That is a cup 
that was presented to the Sligo Rovers from, football, from Everton Football Club. It was presented to Sligo Rovers on the 28th of September in 1950. Now, Rovers played um, Everton in a friendly in 40, 49 and as an act of friendship, Everton presented Sligo Rovers with this actual chalice that was dated back to about, about the 1870s and it was actually made in Edinburgh, sterling silver with, with a gold plate on it. And there's the actual mount and all that was actually that it actually came in. So it's a lovely little item. It's one off. And I'd say the uh, the museum in in Everton Football Club would would love to get their hands on it. Maybe they don't know it exists, but it actually does. Yeah, and it's in Sligo. And the good thing is, it won't be leaving Sligo. It's staying put. <laughs> You know, I don't remember first games or first season, but I always remember going into the showgrounds and standing at the shed end, not in the shed, but at the shed end always. And I remember smaller things like Raf Cotaro had bleach blonde hair, Raf was only a young fella, and I was wondering, my dad would have been explaining to me that, you know, like he's from Tupper Curry. And I used to be thinking, oh my God, Cotaro from Tupper Curry. You know, it, it, to me, it was so unusual at the time. We had a, a very multicultural team back then as well. And you had like the likes of Wesley Charles, from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, like you'd players from all around the world and this was this was mad to me back then because I'd never heard of most of these countries, you know? I was only a child and I couldn't believe it like. And that's that's kind of I used to be saying to well, where is that? Where in the world is that place where like whether it was Barbados or somewhere, you know, there was some real random countries covered there by the showgrounds at one stage and it was that's still true to this day I guess. Oh, go follow it, yeah, go follow it. Orange is play up, yeah? Sort yourselves out. You've got a minute to sort yourselves out. Daniel Kelly, sort out the greens. I remember signing. <laughs> when I think back, it was it was crazy. I was obviously living at home. I was still in still in Summerhill. I was in Fort, Fort Year. And I signed uh, what I thought was a contract, <laughs> but it was a registration form. And uh, I signed it on the back. The, remember the dress rooms were up here. I signed it on the back of the car. Walked home, told my parents, and my parents killed me. You know, how do you sign them? You don't know what you signed, or you know, you shouldn't have signed and all this. And I said, I didn't care. I wanted to sign, and it was, anyway, it was only a registration form. And I actually was at the League Cup semi final against Home Farm, stood in the shed, and I think two weeks later, I came on against Pats and away, to, away in Richmond Park. I came on for about two minutes, I think we won 2 1. It was what I always wanted, I suppose, being a fan, coming to games all my life, living so close to the place, you know, grandmother's house at the back of the main stand, you know, you were, you were, you seen the place every day, you know, so, uh, yeah, it was, at the time, I was just mad to get out there, but looking back, yeah, it was, it was a special, special moment, um, special moment, and for my family as well, it was very special. I think the link was stronger, I suppose, with David Pugh, you know, with the late Michael McGowan, you know, they, they were a huge influence on it. And if you look at all the players that came out of Summerhill College and went on and played it, as I used to the top level in this country, there was quite a few and quite a good few. But there was a link, you know, I remember getting, when Rovers as a kid, you know, it was a replay of winter football, FEI Cup, you got the half day to come down and watch the match, so it was huge. The aspect of Sligo Rovers giving lads a platform to go on and have full time careers in the on the professional side of it in England and in Ireland has been a huge part of it. And in fact, uh, in that Summerhill College team that that, that, that I played in, the, the main man in the team was Paul McGee. And Paul McGee was probably one of the, the real stars of Sligo Rovers. And he went on to have a, a great career internationally and and in England. International football was was just the cream on the cake. And it was just you like floating. You don't believe it yourself. It's sort of. It's, it was the weirdest life ever. You're living this high life and you're getting all this. And, it, and I, I was very, very lucky with injury, so I wasn't, you know, I just enjoyed every minute of it and just made the most of it that I could. I must be the oldest supporter in, uh, of Sligo Rovers in, 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 in the town, the county. Yeah, I enjoy the football, and uh, I, I still go, I still go, of course. The Davey gave me a season ticket, so I, I used up that season ticket. Well, I was uh, walking up to up the last few years, but when I get the lift then, it's handy. And then when I walk into the showgrounds, my seat is kept there for me. Bertie Devins and uh, Sean have the, 
the vacancy there. And the, the, another chap there, J J Jarlin Mulligan, he's, he's there as well. And there's a few more then as well. And they all pass all the few sweets. <laughs> but uh, the Slag Rovers to me was, I never got into the Gaelic or rugby as much. It was all Slag Rovers soccer. I love going into the showgrounds and going in the turnstile. And as soon as you walk in the turnstile, you know, you have a little bit of a word about the game and then you walk in and then there's going to be someone like Paddy House or Pat Wallace or Michael Clancy selling, selling tickets for something. And then as you go in, you know, you meet, you meet some of the other guys like Joan Malloy and Anthony Confederate and Mickey Kelly and all these people. And that's what I always say is that it can take 20 minutes to walk in the turnstile in the showgrounds and for me to get up to the press box because they end up stopping to talk to so many people. But you might have something to say about, you know, oh, I haven't seen you since the last game, what do you think of that? Or, or what do you reckon about that fella there, the, the new signing or something? And it's one thing I think that you get with kind of having a community club where everybody knows everybody. Sligo Rovers have always been seen as a representative of the town and the county and of the region even. We have supporters who come from Belmullet, from the top end of Donegal, every week to matches. Another man from Mullingar who turns up every week, every home match in Sligo. Rovers are always seen as a representative of an area and that comes from the fact that they're a community club owned and run by the community. We're in the west of Ireland where, you know, where soccer in general wasn't heard of. Nobody wanted to come to, come to Sligo to, for, for a fo football, you know, because most of the clubs are all in, in Dublin. And the, I think the hierarchy never really wanted Sligo Rovers to, in, in football because it was too far away. The showgrounds is owned by the people, for the people, for sport and recreation. It can never be sold. It has been, there's a few times that it's been thought about, but it's for the people. We're at a stage now where we hear so much about getting more women involved in sport, getting more women following sport and everything. And a part of that, I suppose, is making sure that women don't feel intimidated going to sport or watching it. And the one thing about the showgrounds is that I've, I've never felt that anyway. I don't think anybody does. Any of the women going to the showgrounds have been going for years and, and nobody thinks anything less of them. And that is vital. It's vital that you know families can go along for a good evening out, an enjoyable one, a safe evening as well. And I think that's always been the case at the showgrounds. You know, things might have been different 20 or so years ago, but nowadays you see a lot of families, you see a lot of young kids coming together. I suppose that's that's probably what, what their, their weekly treat is in a, a night out at the showgrounds. More and more clubs are introducing underage women's teams, maybe senior women's teams as well. They're as much a part of the club as the boys' underage teams, and there shouldn't ever be any reason why they shouldn't feel like they are uh, an important part of the club because they are and that's definitely the future they're, they're the future they're the ones who you are hoping in a few years time can be part of a Sligo over senior women's team because that's ultimately what you're what you're aiming to get and they should always be made feel as though they are just as important as the under 19 boys or the under 17 boys whatever it is and that is vital well I ended up chairing Sligo Rovers really off the back of my dad and my family growing up because the Rovers were a huge part of life growing up here in Dublin. We didn't support any English clubs. Friday nights, Drumcondra and Home Farm were the only ones with lights at the time. We'd go on a Friday night to watch them and I always remember there'd always be somebody smoking a pipe and the Mick McQuaid tobacco and your dad would be there and it was just the end of a great week and we were there as a family and as a set of kids and it became really the fabric of our life and at that time, before the internet, it was the Sligo champion and reading the champion and who they were signing and who they weren't signing. And that really led on that I got into Sligo through some friends down there, Tony Quinn and Vincent Nally, but really very much so in my father's business and following in his passion and his love. And he's gone a long time, 20 years now at this stage. But I still feel a closeness to him from my association with the Rovers. And uh, I suppose it's like everything in life, it's easy to get in, it's not quite so easy to get out and it's a disease I'm glad to be afflicted with. Rovers, and I don't think people get this, how important they are to any local media, if you like, because when things are going good, people actually 
really, really want to read about it every single week. They will buy papers, they will keep them as souvenirs and a lot of people still buy the paper to read what Liam Buckley has to say or what he said about the game or whoever the manager is, they, they still want to read what they're saying and you know a lot of people don't buy papers now that's fine because the match report for a local paper is sort of, it's dead somewhat because people get them online, there's no need to be buying a paper just to get a match report but the aftermatch reaction is what people still still love to read and Sligo Rovers to their credit they're always really really uh, obliging when it comes to getting interviews with lads or chatting to players or doing features or doing anything. Lane time again and we go back to the square one again. Players coming from Dublin, coming from Derry and that, that was, I mean, there was no practice, there was no free kicks, there was no saying who'll play who. You brought up fellas and they said I play midfield so they were in midfield and whatnot. And it was... It, it, look, it wasn't the right way to run the league, but I mean, it was just probably keeping the football going for the town. At that particular time, you know, they uh, were going through a bad spell and obviously bottom of the league, three points, you know, and, and that, that scenario leads to sort of relegation, you know, if it, if it was in place at the time. But I was really sort of disappointed to see the, the, the area, you know, or the pitch, etc. And, you know, it, it, just, it just sort of... It, it needed it needed somebody to come in and, and ruffle feathers, put it that way. Billy was a different man altogether. We got young fellas to come over, and they were good lads. I mean, they played in probably the reserves over at whatever club they came from. I was picking a player here and I picking a player there, bringing in people from Scotland, from people from England, attracting Paul McGee. And Billy would have been did a massive job on me, a huge job. He sort of polished me, polished me to be a professional, not to be just a flamboyant young guy running down the line and doing what happens and whatever doesn't happen. He was, he, he sorted me out big time. I think he was a man, that he put a lot of thought into the game and whatnot, you know, and before a match he had us down in a, in a room and a table and he'd, he'd have all bottle caps on the table and he'd have the back four and he could have two fellas and he could have probably ski wide on the right, but we were all there in designs and this is what he wanted. You know, it's the first time I ever seen that done. You know, like nowadays it's all on boards and whatnot now. But think he started with bottle caps. The game I always remember most in the showgrounds from, from being a kid was the year that we won the league. And I was in at the just in at the fence and we we're playing Cork Celtic at home and they'd Bobby Tambling playing and the guy called Ludzik in goal. And we the young fellas and we were coming like we were coming to win the league and whatever and they went one nil up and we attacked and attacked wave after wave and eventually we got an equaliser one all and it looked like a point was all we we're going to get and I'll never forget at the end one of the best players that I remember and I built him up in my mind to be even better was Michael Betts central midfielder of the year we won the league and he curled in one of the best goals I've ever seen certainly meant the most to me and I always remember tambling fall into his knees and, just, and the crowd and the noise and the excitement of these people and the sense of just euphoria going out the gate. I always remember one at Finn Harps, we were getting battered. We could have won, we could have lost 6 0. I'll always remember because as a striker, you're looking back and freaking Patterson was diving all over the show, pulling balls out of corners, tipping onto the bar, and five minutes ago, got a ball through a dummy, came inside and drilled it in the corner 1 0. Won. You know what I mean? I knew what the people of Sligo wanted and needed. I mean, I. I I'm not saying I invented, but I brought this thing out called the Golden Goal, where you bought you bought tickets, and you know if you if your ticket was closest to the the goal, we paid out fifty quid, but we were taking in something like five hundred quid on tickets. So really, we were in, in a way we were balancing balancing the books and paying people that we didn't pay, and and when you do that, then they believe what you believe that you want to win, you want to be a winner. Oh, the pressure of the last four games, like you think about, you know, every, like that was it. Everybody was into soccer in Sligo. End of story. There was no, yeah, we'll, you know, well, what's that movie today? We'll go down to, yeah, I just, I, but, but as I said, I just, I just remembered, I, like I coped with the excitement, I could deal with it and I could perform. A new experience again, I mean, to go for the league, I mean, I never heard of it in my lifetime, Sligo Rovers, last game of the season, to win the league and who was it but Shamrock Rovers again and like in the place I mean was 
mad. The thing that really thrilled me was to see to see the supporters in this ground at that particular time. There must have been 10,000 people here to get in. And I thought to myself, taking the seat in the dugout, Billy, <laughs> how, how can, you know, how is it going to work out if you don't win it? And I said, don't talk to me about that, God. I, we are going to win today, and that's the way I want it. We are winning today because these guys are fit. They're good, they can score goals, and they can they concede few goals. That was a class day for us, and the fact that like, it was brilliant television, if you like. Without took the lead after 10 minutes, Gary Humes. <laughs> Doing well, ticking on, and then Shamrock Rovers hit us. Young Jimmy McGee's son, Paul, I think his name, he equalised, and you're saying you're not going to go through this again. I was hoping that what we talked about, the character within the team, the people like Fago and, and big Chris Rutherford, big Stinson, all these guys had, had character to, to push on the other guys. And then all of a sudden it's, oh my God, can we come back from that then? And then I curled the ball and then Chris, he banged it in with his head and then I finished the last one. That was my best League of Ireland year that I can remember, just winning the league with Sligo Rovers. The win it, I mean, it, it was a great achievement and, and to be on the team as a local, it was even better for me. Well, one of your players who worked extremely hard this season, who, who came right to the forefront of the soccer scene, is your own local hero, Paul McGee. Now, Paul, you've had a bum of a season and I'm sure you're very happy. Yes, this is probably the most important game of my life today. Yeah. And when Sean McGrover's got one back each, I, tears came to my eyes, Yeah. literally on the wing. And yeah. then when we went 2-1 up, and I heard those thousands of Sligo people. I was proud. I went mean, out and won. Oh, you're a great and we're Best, best town in the, in the world. For support. I think I actually got started about the early 80s. I kind of got the, the little appetite for it. And I suppose over the years, the appetite has grown into a, a passion. From now, it's gone into an obsession. I would love to have every program of related to Sligo Rovers from 28. I think it's going to be very, very hard to do, but I'll keep trying. There's always one little program out there. It has been on the go for a long, long time since Rovers were founded, about 1928. The first time I from what I can gather, Fraser Ward was at a cup semi-final in 1935. Then he awarded the 39 final. We got bet by Shelburne after replay in 1940. It was there again. We got bet again by Shamrock Rovers 3-0. 1970, three games, winning well, and we lost it on the third replay. The support we got, I mean, was unbelievable. Even when we came back, you know, like I mean, the town was packed, and you know, it was just sad for them because they see they had never won the cup, and we had a great chance and having three occasions to do it, you know, like we were never going to get a chance again probably with that, with a side like that that we had. But look, at the time, I was just lucky enough that me, it was me first of a, a few finals to play in and so. That was 1970, 78, John Carpenter. We won't say anything much more about that. We lost 1-0, 1981. Another one, Dundalk, beat us 2-0 corner kick direct into the back of the net. I think her hearts were broken. 1983 was a little bit different. We had a very bad season. Rovers were very, very poor, I think, that late, that year. Nobody gave us a, a chance. I mean, if you were a betting man, you wouldn't put money on us, you know. The Saturday before the, the match, the Independent or someone done it on the managers who'd win the cup. And ten of them said bows and Patsy said, me head says bows, but me heart says Sligo. You know, he was the only one that kind of stood by us. We went to Daly Mount to a cup final with possibly, I would say, the worst team ever to represent Sligo in a cup final. So it came to the day anyway, and you couldn't have gotten the worst day in it. And at that particular morning, we went to Daly Mount, there was snow in Ben Bulbin. People might realise, but I mean, they had a very good side. Going 1-0 down again, as I said, yeah, like, you never think you're going to come back. 
we just had to keep fighting. The one thing about us, like, we were good fighters. The ball came across to Stenny and then he just hit it. Over it comes Elliot. Stenson! 1-1. One, one. Goes on a run and I said, Stenny, will you hold on, I have to catch up on you. So he gave me a, a wee carry for about 10 or 15 yards and that was enjoyable. But then we came back into the, into the game. In the last 20 minutes, we were the better team. And McDonald back is on a back for Harry McLaughlin, who's got a bit of space and he's got two players inside him. The little trip. Oh, that's a beautiful goal by McLaughlin. Surely a goal to win a cup final. This is what Harry was capable of. You know, I mean, he was small, but he was dainty and he could do these things. People say across or whatnot, but I mean, to me, Harry knew what he was doing. The whistle went and all of a sudden it was just grabbing one, one another that we didn't realise that it happened. And all of a sudden, I mean, there was hundreds or a couple of thousand people on, on the pitch and they were all just delighted for themselves that they were there on the occasion that this happened. And this supporter here, he's been at every one of the Sligo matches in the Cup and there are tears streaming down his face now. I remember being close to poor old Fraser the day we won that and to see a man in his 70s or 80s crying as a result of winning a, a, a piece of silverware. Like it was a, a very, and very special for an awful lot of the old supporters at that, that particular time. It ended up like that they were getting the enjoyment that we were feeling as well and they had probably seen all the bad days that we had as well and now it was their turn to celebrate. <laughs> Them days you would know the people straight away, the fellas you met, they did they, you know, like, it was great to see them having this excitement and whatnot and as they, they were going to make the most of it as we done. It took the team float over two and a half hours to travel the mile and a half journey. Garthy hadn't time to estimate the side of the crowds present. They were too busy trying to control them. Seeing Tony Fagan lift the cup, you know, was just unreal and the joy that that brought. To say that I'd be the next one to do it was... If somebody had said that to me, I wouldn't have believed him. And it was unreal. It still gets mentioned to me all the time in anything that I do. You know, that you're a local, you lifted the cup. Uh, what did it mean? I don't think words could express what it means. It's, you know... I know when you talk to Connor, it'll be the same thing. It's just a privilege and an honour and something I suppose that I never dreamed of when I when I started off that I'd be that lucky that it would happen and I suppose to lift three trophies in the one year you know was was, was again will anybody from Sligo ever do it again you know I was just a lucky one I suppose Dykes he came in what can you do he's a big lad he won everything tackled picked up cups as I used to say to him like I played against him a few times and Jeannie his feet were about size 15 he wouldn't miss you <laughs> George my grandfather was, was a centre half as well and he played with him and I suppose Freddie and, and was well well known here and played here and John Joe Dykes you know the captain of the first Olympics team I suppose you know and it's their history it's only later in life that I realised that when I was going to other grounds that people would come up to me and say you know there's always Dykes is involved with Sligo and things like that so their name was always sort of involved with it uh, so it was great. It was great. It was tough at the time. I can tell you, it was. It was changed times from where this beautiful ground we're sitting in now. It was, but uh, it was great. I wouldn't change it. McStay came, and I think he changed everything. Uh, he changed the, the whole club, the way it was done. He changed the whole philosophy around it. Uh, coaching was very much what he done, and uh, I think he built the team. You know, the first season that he came, we were unlucky. We got relegated, and I remember sitting in his house after being relegated and, and he was so upset he had a vision of bringing young people in and you know he, he brought in the right players they were young and he, he played himself and Martin McDonald was in the team and you know Martin had travelled with me through the Dermot Keeley we were the only two Rovers players two local lads we would say through the Dermot Keeley area and it was, it was strange when you were going away to an away game there was only two of us uh, Ski was there for a while as well which was great because again I don't think he gets the recognition that he should get it has been a local, you know. Ski was one of the best players I ever saw in the football pitch with. Everybody says it was the lights. I, I think the lights the lights happened, you know. I remember that game for different reasons. I was sent off. I was the first man sent off under lights. So <laughs> But I think it just changed and I think there was an atmosphere around the town that, you know, we couldn't get beaten from that night on and we went on a tremendous run and I think again it was down to it just worked, it gelled, you know. It, Winning teams, we're still all friendly, you know, we were all together 
you know, for the centenary, but we are all friendly, you know. I've played in teams when relegated, we don't talk. So winning teams sort of keep you together. Raining, I was delighted. I got up to that morning and it was it was raining. It was really, really raining heavy and it brought back memories of when Rovers won the Cup in Daily Month, I suppose. And the only man to raise the FBI Cup for Sligo Rovers. They won it in 1983. Little things, like we, we went on Francie's bus over to Lansdowne Road, nobody noticed us going in. You know, the big bus was full of the wives and the directors and all that, you know, and everybody that was a team, it wasn't. We'd planned that. Um, we spent a week in Scotland before Hamlet Willie as well, so we were well prepared. And I remember Derry coming out, and I, I, I just slag Liam Coyle and that, because and, I played with him afterwards, and they were singing a song. You know, and that a Celtic song, it, it only made us more determined. This is Eddie Allant. Always round goal, but still Allant. Gold got back to fight in with a challenge. And actually can see the first corner of the second half. Great crowd at Lansdowne Road. Sligo fans to roar on. This Gavin Dykes is up, the other centre defender, Declan Boyle is up too. And the corner will come from Eddie Allen. Into the danger zone, it's there! Johnny Kenny has got it! Were we lucky on the day? Yes, we were. We, but you make your own luck in, in cup football. So, uh, yeah, it was a huge occasion and a hugely proud moment for me and for my family. That they have hoped and waited and prayed for all these years. Gavin Dykes, the chairman's son, congratulated. And there's his dad giving him a great, warm embrace. Kevin Dykes, chairman of Sligo Rovers. It means so much to the family, so much to the town, of the city as they call it in Sligo. Here's the FAI Cup. It's with Gavin Dykes. It's been won by Sligo Rovers. Oh